<coughs> All right, we're starting, shall we? Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name's uh, Richard Dolby, and uh, I'm, it's a privilege for me to be president of the Institute of Materials, Minerals, and Mining for two years, but I'm also chairman of the organizing committee. So it's on both those uh, capacities that I welcome you very warmly today. Um, we're having our fifth Congress, as I think um, many of you will know, and we decided again to hold it in our wonderful buildings in Carlton House Terrace, so hopefully the weather will keep fine and you can shift from one building to another without too much inconvenience. Uh, before I say any more, I should uh, tell you the Royal Society evacuation procedures, and uh, we have to listen if there is a fire for a continuous sounder, and then we leave by the various exits uh, and uh, which are designated fire exits and the assembly point is by the Duke of York steps um, which is uh, either that way or that way that way <laughs> Duke of York steps and it says don't stand on the road so that, having done that um, I'd like to say first of all I think we've got a, 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 a an excellent program for all of you over three days if you're stopping the full three days and we've got our usual mix of uh, high quality plenary lectures uh, and this year we've got 17 symposia on different topics uh, each with two keynote lecturers and we also have two master classes one on packaging and one on aero engines so I hope that you're going to enjoy at least one or more of those there is no change to the program today uh, the official opening of the of the event is at 1.30 when Sir Mark Moody Stewart of Anglo-American PLC will be here to do that for us. Um, I could remind you also of the public lecture tonight by Professor Rod Smith of, of Imperial College, which is about uh, uh, materials issues in railways. I, if you're not down to, to, to come, please make a note of that. And uh, in between the end of the sessions, the symposia this afternoon and the, and the lecture, there's a drinks reception at one Carlton House Terrace. I would like to draw your attention to one change in a plenary lecture on Friday, if you were going to be here. And in place of Dr. Krista Dulu, who couldn't at the last minute make it, uh, I'm delighted to say I have Professor George Smith uh, talking on nanotechnology. This is uh, on Friday lunch at 1.30, a uh, nanotechnology friend or foe. So if you were planning to come on Friday, I'm sure you'll enjoy the replacement lecture. The posters are in 1CHT, and I hope you'll stop by and have a look at those. Uh, there are going to be prizes for the best poster each day, and the plan is to present the prizes at the afternoon, at the end of the plenary session in each afternoon. So uh, please stop by, and of course the food is in 1CHT uh, throughout the event. There are also a number of exhibitions, and uh, please look at your programs to see where they are and who is exhibiting. Um, and also, I'd, finally, I'd like to thank the sponsors and uh, co-sponsors very much for uh, their help in organizing this event and for their financial support. Um, you'll find a full list of these in, in your program booklet. Fine, well now, uh, mobile phones, ladies and gentlemen, off please, if you haven't thought about it. Uh, and before we start, I'd now like to make a brief introduction to Harry Badisha, who I'm delighted to say is going to give us our first plenary. Well, Harry Badisha, as many of you will know, uh, is Professor of Physical Metallurgy at the University of Cambridge, um, but he is now also a distinguished adjunct professor at the Graduate Institute of Ferrous Technology Post-Tech in South Korea, and he's just off the plane, but he's looking pretty good, so I think we're, we're in for a good lecture. Uh, you will all know, uh, that know him that his main research interest is solid phase, phase transformations and uh, particularly prediction by modeling of microstructure and properties and, and steels has been one of his main uh, areas of, of, uh, of effort. And of course you then have to verify your models, don't you Harry? <laughs> um, as far as I'm concerned, he's interna internationally distinguished in many different areas, including my own, which is welding and he's many, made many unique contributions. So I'm personally delighted he agreed to give this very first plenary lecture of the Congress, and his title is Metals and Alloys, Exploiting the Gaps Between Mathematical Models. Uh, so would you please welcome Professor Harry Badisha.
Well, first of all, thank you very much for turning up for this first lecture because, you know, the official op opening is actually at 12 o'clock, so I wasn't sure how many people would be here. So, thank you. Um, it's traditional to start off a lecture on mathematical modeling with a diagram like this where you plot the length scale, you identify the different subject areas and the different disciplines. And I think this is a, an outdated diagram. And I, I intend to demonstrate to you that this is probably not the right way to proceed, where you start from a very small scale and try to link all these models and get to the final stage. There are fundamental problems with this approach and also the identification of specific subject areas. Uh, my, my picture of this is that this is a subject which is interdisciplinary. You know, whoever does this work has to know physics, has to know engineering, has to know material science. So I call this materials modeling. And I don't think we need to connect up these models. I think there are fundamental problems in trying to model materials as complex as we deal with routinely. There just isn't the science and there is unlikely to be the science which can tackle that level of complexity. But we can use these models nevertheless to improve the design process in a disconnected way. And that's what I hope to demonstrate. And in particular, I will be jumping from this sort of a scale all the way to this sort of a scale, more or less ignoring what happens in the middle, just to demonstrate that we don't need a sequence of models. Okay, so here's a question, first thing in the morning. The problem is to design a bulk nanocrystalline steel, which is very strong, is tough and cheap. And of course, uh, you know, these are like uh, apple pie and motherhood statements. Uh, we need to put some substance onto statements like these. What do I mean by bulk? Well, that's the size of a human being there. Yeah? Whatever material I create, I must be able to make big objects with it. What do you ma I mean by you know, nanocrystalline and strong? Well, most of you are familiar with carbon nanotubes. Whatever we design must be stronger than carbon nanotubes. Okay? And the controlling scale must be of the order of a carbon nanotube. And what do I mean by cheap? Well, weight for weight, it's got to be cheaper than bottled water. Okay? So that is our design problem, which we are going to deal with in the next 40 minutes or so. Well, first of all, if we look at uh, work done back in the 1950s and even earlier, you look at the strength of iron. Um, you know, they achieved 10 gigapascals without any difficulty. And the theoretical strength is of the order of 21 gigapascals. So there's a lot more potential there. Uh, these experiments were done on single crystals uh, and they're small enough to avoid defects such as dislocations. Of course, as you make them larger, the strength collapses because the probability of finding defects increases. This is a thermodynamic property. Entropy favors the existence of defects. So this, this is probably not a good way of exploiting the strength of iron. And if you look at the literature on carbon nanotubes, they don't seem to have appreciated this problem of scale because they make claims about the strength of carbon nanotubes being of the order of 130 gigapascals uh, and 1.2 terapascal modulus. And these are numbers, you know, of which dreams are made of. Yeah? We would really love to have strength of that order. But what they forget is that you're looking at minute particles. Okay? As soon as you start scaling, things up. Thermodynamic tells you that, you know, a defect has an excess enthalpy, which doesn't favor its existence. But as soon as you introduce a defect, when you have large numbers of entities, you will have a configurational entropy, which will favor the existence of defects. And if I do a calculation for a carbon nanotube of engineering dimensions, using numbers which they publish, then you will see that, you know, there are of the order of 10 to the 20 critical defects in such an object. And this is the reason why I don't think that the strength of a carbon nanotube rope is ever going to exceed that of steel once you get to dimensions more than 2 millimeters. So aiming for perfection is not a good way of achieving strength. On the other hand, if you introduce defects into the material by very severe deformation, then, of course, you lose your size sensitivity because we are getting strength directly from defects. And here, for example, is a commercial steel in which you can get a strength of five and a half gigapascals without any difficulty. The strain you put in is equivalent to taking 50 grams of material and stretching it out into two kilometers. Okay. 
Uh, and you can see that the strength is insensitive to size compared with the single crystals that I showed earlier. The problem, of course, is that, you know, by putting in severe deformation, you limit the shape of the product that you can get. And there are complicated processes by which we can maintain the shape, but they are far too expensive. So I've, I've got this thread in my briefcase, and it really feels like wool. You know, this is stainless steel, but it feels like wool. I'd be very happy if somebody made a shirt out of this for me so that I could give lectures in a stainless steel shirt. So this isn't going to help us to make, uh, you know, big structures. Okay. So strength produced by deformation limits the shape. It's good because it's size insensitive. And strength in small particles relies on perfection. So it's doomed as you increase the size of the particle. That's a fundamental principle. It's not that we can't manufacture, uh, uh, we can't create a better manufacturing process. It's entropy which says that defects will be there. Now, this is a wonderful process. It's thermomechanical processing. And all of you have touched it in some way because there's approximately 20 billion tons of thermomechanically processed steel in service throughout the world. And the fact is you don't notice it because it's such a good technology that it doesn't crash like computers. Yeah? It's a highly reliable technology. And that's where you know, engineers really thrive, is making reliable things. And I think Microsoft should really employ mechanical engineers to get that discipline. Now, in this uh, revolution which ha happened around 1960s, um, the grain size was refined. Okay, so it was refined from something of the order of 100 micrometers down to 20 micrometers. So this is the shape of a grain. And of course here we are producing large quantities of materials. Every year about 1.1 billion tons of materials in precisely controlled conditions and precisely controlled chemical compositions. So how far can we take this process? Can we actually reduce the grain size to one nanometer using this process? Well, we can ask that question. Uh, basically, grains are of this shape, roughly. If I add up all the surface over there and multiply by the interface energy, then I can work out how much energy is stored in the form of surfaces. And that energy has to come from somewhere. And in this process, it comes from phase transformations. So all I have to do is take that total energy the interfacial area times the amount of surface per unit volume and balance it against the chemical free energy change that we have and I should be able to predict the theoretical minimum grain size possible using this process. Okay? And here is a calculation. So this is the theoretical minimum grain size as a function of the chemical free energy change or if you like the undercooling below the equilibrium temperature and you know there's, there's, we, we could get to very very small grain sizes. But when you look at what happens in practice, and there has been a huge amount of research here, we, we are really stuck at about one micrometer. Okay? In spite of all the huge uh, and very clever experiments, we are stuck at about one micrometer. And the reason is that when you try to do transformations at a large undercooling, you get recalescence, you get heating up of the material by the transformation itself. And when you take account of that heating up, because we want to produce large quantities, uh, you can see that we are not going to get much less than one micrometer in grain size using this process. We need to do something better. So thermomechanical processing is limited by recalescence. We need to think about how to store energy inside our metal rather than releasing it as heat, enthalpy change. Okay. And perhaps we need to reduce the rate of transformation and it's always good to transform at a lower temperature because that enhances nucleation rates, etc., and refines the microstructure. So let's do that. Well, one very good way of storing energy is displacive transformations because they cause a change in shape, and that change in shape is enormous. So this is a sample which was polished flat and then allowed to transform. And you can see the surface has changed. You know, the shear strain there is of the order of 0.26 which is many orders of magnitude greater than a typical elastic strain. So if this is surrounded by many other crystals, then you will store a huge amount of elastic strain energy in the material. Okay, so this is a good way of reducing recalescence. So let's imagine then how a particular transformation product, bainite, forms. Well, it forms without any diffusion, 
but because of the temperatures, the carbon is able to escape and then to precipitate as cementite. Now this, this part of the microstructure is a bad stage because we end up with these cementite particles which are brittle. Now many, many decades ago it was known how to stop this stage from developing. We can stop the process here so we end up with just very fine plates of ferrite and carbon enriched austenite and that is by the addition of silicon because this is the cementite crystal structure. You try to put a silicon atom in it, it simply doesn't want to be there. Okay? And that's illustrated, for example, in this phase diagram calculation, which is done using uh, commercial software, empty data. So this you can buy off the shelf. Uh, if we force the silicon inside this, uh, if we force the silicon to be inside the cementite, then your alloy ends up in the austenite phase field. You do not precipitate cementite. And you can also do kinetic calculations to show that silicon not only retards the precipitation of cementite, but it also reduces the fraction of cementite as possible. Okay. So this has been known for decades and decades, and it's not a problem. But let me go back to thermodynamics. We want to transform at a very low temperature. Okay. And really, Thermodynamic data which go into commercial programs are measured at temperatures where equilibrium is reached rapidly. Okay. So really they focus on regions of the phase diagram where experiments are possible within reasonable times. And what we want to do is we want to ask the question, can we produce bainite at minus 100 degrees centigrade? Well, we've got to extrapolate these phase boundaries. And do I just put a ruler on here and extrapolate it like this? or do I extrapolate it like this? I need some kind of theory to tell me how to extrapolate. And that's where, you know, your thermodynamic models come in. And there's a whole plethora of thermodynamic models. And depending on which one I use, I can predict the kinetics of these plates, you know, very large differences. Okay. That's not good enough. The precision that we require in microstructure modeling has to be much better than this. One of the reasons is that we use very simple thermodynamic models in doing generalized calculations. So, for example, there are usually adaptations of the regular solution model where even though there is a finite entropy of mixing, you assume, the random, uh, you assume that the atoms are all randomly mixed. Okay. That's, of course, not correct. Uh, if you have a finite entropy of mixing, then you ought to expect a non-random distribution of atoms at low temperatures. So we've been developing for many, many years uh, a quasi-chemical model for interstitial solutions where we discard the assumption of a random distribution of atoms and without going into detail, after a huge amount of algebra, you come up with this equation for the free energy of mixing. Now you might be familiar with this. this is the entropy of mixing which comes from random distributions of atoms and this is the correction to that because we don't have a random distribution of atoms and similarly this term at the top is the usual term in regular solution models for the entropy of mixing and this is the correction because we don't have a random distribution. Now the only thing I want you to focus on is this term beta here which depends on the interaction energy between two carbon atoms. If I take them from infinity and I bring them to the nearest neighbor sites, then what is the interaction between those two carbon atoms? I need that energy. I can't get that energy because the solubility of carbon in a ferrite is virtually zero. So you can't really do an accurate enough experiment to measure that. So do we give up? Well, this is where we can draw on first principle calculations. Because they're ideal for thing, problems like this, where you, have, you define a unit cell, you place the carbon atoms in these positions and in these positions and see, you know, see, see what uh, the interaction energy should be. Now, the reason I'm really interested in this scenario, where I've got carbon atoms in nearest neighbor situations, okay? but there are also many approximations involved in first principles calculations. So I'd like to test the same model by placing carbon atoms here and here because I know for sure 
that there must be a small attractive energy between those two carbon atoms because otherwise we would never get tetragonal martensite. Okay? So this is my metallurgical test for first principles modeling. If it doesn't come out with an attractive energy here, then something is wrong. And of course, I need to take carbon atoms at an infinite distance apart, bring them together inside the steel. And I can't do that because that would, take, uh, that would be impossible in a computer. So I'm assuming that three unit cells apart is an infinite distance to bring them in from. Okay, so there's an approximation for you. Okay, sure enough, I get a positive interaction energy when the carbon atoms are situated two neighbors apart and a huge repulsion when they're in near neighbor sites. I can now take this number, put it into that thermodynamic equation and do better calculations of the phase diagram. Okay. So that's the thermodynamic part. Um, it also explains kinetic phenomena. For example, the enormous concentration dependence of the diffusion coefficient of carbon in steel. Okay? It can't be explained by the normal darkened parameters, activity versus concentration dependence. It's really this huge repulsion between carbon atoms that gives the majority of the concentration dependence. Let's assume now that I have some kinetic theory as well to deal with the nucleation process and the growth process. Okay? Without going into any details, basically dissociation of dislocations leads to the formation of a new phase. So we've got all the theory in place. And here are some calculations of the transformation temperature for a hypothetical alloy as a function of concentration. According to this, you know, I could actually produce bainite at room temperature. I could even go to below room temperature. Okay, so there's a huge potential for producing fine microstructures. I need to look also at the kinetics. And unfortunately, you know, if I made an alloy of this composition, it would take about 100 years to form bainite. Okay? But just for fun, we have made that alloy. And it is archived in my office for 100 years. It's been in progress for two years. Okay? And one sample is also going to be placed in the Science Museum within the next month or so for people to watch for 100 years. The surface of the sample will change if transformation happens, and I hope it doesn't happen during my lifetime. Otherwise, the theory will be wrong. <laughs> but in, in, in real life, of course, we have to have faster transformation. So we have a smaller carbon concentration, and we've designed an alloy. I won't go into details. Here is the microstructure using an optical micrograph. And, you know, if a steel person looked at this microstructure, they would say, yes, it's a very nice micrograph, but so what? You know, I've seen things like this before. Okay? This, there's nothing particularly exciting to a steel person looking at this micrograph. So I want you to take a deep breath because the next micrograph is fantastic. It's a transmission electron micrograph of the same thing. You need to look at the optical micrograph because the TM can be misleading. You're looking at a very small region of material. What I want you to notice is the scale here. Okay? What we've done is we've produced plates of ferrite separated by austenite, which are finer than typical carbon nanotubes. So this is a carbon nanotube produced uh, at the same magnification here, courtesy of Ian Kinlock in Cambridge. Okay? In a large sample, which is big in all dimensions, okay, three dimensions. We've got a structure which is finer than carbon nanotubes in a steel which is extremely cheap. It's very strong, it's of the order of two and a half gigapascals. It has uniform ductility because this is also a composite material. This is the parent phase which is very ductile. Uh, there's no deformation involved in producing this. Uh, no rapid cooling because we can engineer the transformation time so we can Take it out at a thousand degrees, gently walk over to a pizza oven and do the heat treatment. There are no residual stresses involved here. And it's extremely cheap and uniform. We have tested sections of 80 millimeters in all dimensions. Okay? And the properties are, are very good. Now, supposing you test this material at even higher strain rates, uh, you know. This is firing projectiles at it. Then actually the strength goes up to 10 gigapascals. So it immediately suggests an application. And the application is armor here. I, I don't know what this battlefield threat is because nobody will tell me what it is. 
the people who do the experiments want to keep that secret. But I'm told that ordinary armor would be penetrated easily by this battlefield threat. And here is a quantitative measure, which also takes account of mass, where this new material actually beats titanium armor, which is far more expensive. And it's almost the same as alumina, which can't take multiple shots. Okay. Now, I'm going to show you another slide. And some of you, the men, might feel a little bit of pain when you see this slide. But I found this on an aircraft magazine, and it's very, very relevant to what I'm talking about. You know, aircraft magazines have other things than just, uh, you know, helping with immigration or offshore accounts and so forth. This is a picture that I found on a recent journey. So this is bulletproof underwear, and it's invest invented by the Moscow Steel Research Institute. It contains seven steel plates, and it's supposed to stop an Uzi machine gun fired from five millimeters. I suspect you would still feel a lot of pain. Yeah? <laughs> okay. Now, I think that our armor could be much lighter for the British Mafia as opposed to the Russian Mafia, okay? <laughs> right, just to change the subject a little bit, uh, you know, we make all kinds of claims about mathematical models, but we fail miserably when it comes to actually predicting the properties. None of these properties can be predicted by anybody in the world. If I give you a comprehensive description of the composition, the processing, and the microstructure, nobody can predict any of these properties. Yeah. So there's a challenge for you. And I've made this challenge at many conferences, and nobody has yet contradicted me. Okay. And the reason is, uh, you know, I started off by saying that the sort of materials we deal with have a complexity with which science simply cannot cope. Okay? And it's unlikely ever, I think, to be able to cope. This is just a conservative list of variables of the things which determine properties. And one of the things missing from here is the homogeneity as well. Okay? You know, even if I define these variables, they won't be constant as a function of position inside your material. The problem is very complicated. What we need to do is not to simplify the problem. Because if you simplify the problem, you lose a lot of information. Now, this is an XY plot, and you see, you know, you've got a random set of points. And the reason why it looks like a random set of points is because I'm ignoring two variables. One is time, and one, uh, an axis going out of the board. So I'm going to introduce those two variables, watch the screen carefully, and you'll immediately see what it's all about. Whoops, a daisy. Sorry, that didn't work. That's the danger with movies. Yep. Clear? It's just a man walking. You couldn't have told that by looking at the original slide. Yeah? So, simplifying the problem in material science doesn't actually help. It, it simply wipes out a lot of the knowledge that you need to treat the problem. What we can do is uh, uh, use empirical methods. And the neural network is, in my opinion, it is the best empirical method that you could use. And very simply, it's just a complicated mathematical function which can be very flexible. So it can capture any level of complexity in your data. And here I'm just going to show you the two variables here. I'm plotting the output as a function of just two variables. And by modifying the coefficient here. Oops, a daisy, sorry. Yeah, by modifying that coefficient, I can make that surface sing and dance. Yeah? So it's a very, very flexible mathematical function. Whatever the level of complexity in your problem, you can capture it. Okay? Now, one problem with complicated functions is that you can make it pass through every single data point. So, does it mean that the red curve is what I should pick, or is it the straight line that is a good representation of the behavior? So, this is a problem of overfitting. Even if I had a random set of points, I could make the function pass through every single point. Very easy to solve. I take my data, I randomly divide it into two parts, and I keep one aside as a test data set, and one as a training data set. I only use the training data to create the model. If, if my model is too simple, 
then both the training data, the black points, and the test data will be badly represented. Okay, so I will get a large error here in both data sets. If my model is too complicated, it will perfectly model the training data, but badly represent the unseen data. Okay? So I get a large test error. And somewhere in between, I get an optimum level of complexity. So this problem is solvable. Now, just to see if you're still with me, can somebody who hasn't listened to me before tell me what the next two numbers should be? Mike Loretto. That's, that's intellectually beyond me. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, take a guess. <laughs> no, no, not at all. 10 and 12. It's very good, actually. That's an excellent answer. The numbers are 10 and 12. You basically made a linear model and extrapolated it. So I'm going to show you another equation which perfectly reproduces these numbers, but extrapolates differently. So if I put in a 2 into this equation, I will get exactly 4. If I put in a 4, I'll get exactly 6. If I put 6, I'll get exactly 8. But when I put 8, I get different numbers. Yeah. So this, this is the problem with empirical modeling, is that I, I can actually find more than one function which will perfectly represent the experimental data. But of course, I don't want to just predict the experimental data. I want to extrapolate. So they might behave differently when you extrapolate those functions. And the only way you can decide on what is right and what is wrong is to bring in your physical metallurgy or, or the science. If you don't have that science because the problem is very complicated, then you treat this as an error bar. It's, it's what we call a modeling uncertainty as opposed to the sort of noise that you get when you repeat an experiment, you don't get the same answer because uh, a variable is not controlled. And the great thing about this also is that it identifies in very complicated problems where you should be doing experiments. You know, you, there's no point in doing experiments in this region. This is where you should do experiments. So we can use this to advantage. And here, for example, is a nickel-based alloy which was designed by uh, Frank Toncre. A very, very simple alloy designed to be extremely cheap. Yeah? So, so the designation DC there stands for dirt cheap. Okay? <laughs> and the point of this was that it's got to be used in large quantities and therefore we can't, you know, we can't put rhenium and so forth into it. And this is the structure, nothing unusual. But the alloy was made purely by calculation. These are the experimental results, and these were the predictions. And you can see the error bar is not constant. It depends on where in the input domain you do calculations. So this is an incredibly powerful method. And I want to f finish off by showing you an example where that method, which is completely empirical, okay, leads to actual new science. Now, this is the tallest building in the world. Okay, and that is me, right at the top. And that is one of my former students and his students. So this is like my grandson, okay, in academic terms. And of course it's made out of steel and there's a lot of welded joints. And as the president of this institute will tell you, as soon as that weld cools, you will have residual stresses in your system, which are of the order of the yield strength of the material. So even before you've loaded it, you've actually got loads of stresses in there. And there's no way I can do a heat treatment in a structure like this to get rid of those stresses. Furthermore, there are, there are these heterogeneities. For example, here there is a change in the shape of the surface. So you might get stress concentrations. And fatigue failure is a big problem. Okay? Now, one way, of course, is to make a better weld with a smooth surface, grind it, and so forth. Another way is let's find a method of getting rid of the residual stresses by exploiting transformation plasticity. Because I, I showed you that a displacive transformation is actually a very large deformation. If I can get all these plates to act together, yeah, to cancel out the thermal contraction strains, then I'm onto a winner. Uh, so what, what I don't want is the plates forming at random. Uh, not random, but on pretty, in many variants of the crystallographic planes, because that will cancel out all the shear strains and you just pick up the volume change. I want them to actually orient themselves along the right sort of axis. And of course that happens naturally. You know, you apply a stress and then do a transformation, then 
you will form those variants which compensate for that stress. Yeah, it's just like slip. When I apply a stress, certain slip systems, which are most favorably oriented, will operate. So by doing that, even in a polycrystalline material, I can get very large changes in shape. And you know, this was an experiment done by Albury, and I forget the second author, long time ago, in, in the central electricity generating labs, where they took a tensile <coughs> specimen, heated it to a thousand degrees centigrade, and constrained it, and then allowed it to cool. And of course, as you allow it to cool, you will develop stresses because it's contracting. But if you get a transformation, you can completely cancel out those stresses. The problem here, of course, is that the transformation is exhausted and therefore you build up the stresses again. What we want is this point to come to room temperature and then we will not have any residual stresses. So we've got to design a welding alloy which transforms at a low temperature. And other people have done this, but in any design problem, you see, there's not just one criterion you have to monitor. You have to actually look for good welding properties as well, like toughness. And all the alloys which have been patented fail, really, on that aspect. They have poor toughness. So we decided to do calculations of the toughness, which is a very, very difficult problem, but we used the neural network method. And one of my students, uh, Anand, came up with this diagram where we are plotting manganese and nickel. And it's, it's this which we are interested in, because if you look in all the textbooks, you know, you add nickel into a steel, that will improve the toughness. Yeah? What this shows is something quite strange, that look, if I'm here with a high manganese concentration and I increase the nickel, I'm actually making the toughness worse, because the ductile brittle transition temperature increases. Okay? It's only when I'm at low manganese concentration that I get better toughness. So the first thing we did was, using these calculations, we designed these three alloys to test whether this is a meaningful prediction. And sure enough, at low manganese concentrations, you get a massive improvement in toughness. Okay? So then we look through all the characterization techniques to discover why, why have we got this effect between manganese and nickel. And we discovered a new phase. A okay, new, really interesting phase, which comes up when the driving force is sufficiently large and when the transformation temperature is sufficiently low. And that phase is very, very coarse. So this is an actual micrograph. You know, look at the scale here. If you have particles that size with the same crystal orientation, you get poor toughness. Okay? And this has not been discovered in welding alloys before this, uh, this micrograph. What is this phase? Well, it's very interesting. You start off with very fine plates, but as they grow, they coalesce because the driving force is large enough to allow a fatter plate to exist. A fatter plate gives you a larger strain energy. And the temperature is low enough to stop the carbon building up between these individual platelets to s keep them separate. Okay. So we've now identified the mechanism by which this forms, and we can create an alloy which will cancel out the residual stresses. The work is not complete, but it looks very promising. Now, just to finish off with, in the examples that I've given you, you know, implicitly or explicitly, all of these techniques have been used. Yeah? So, I think in a material science concept, you need to be able to deal with all those techniques. Because, you know, a design problem can't be dealt with with just one kind of mathematical model. And there's also a fundamental difference between the sort of modeling I'm describing and what I call ordinary science. So here is what I mean. So we have to address in material science the problem at the level of complexity that it is posed. The normal method is that we simplify it until we can develop a rigorous mathematical theory, because that's exciting. And then we validate that theory using a simple simplified experiment. That's very good, but we've lost the technological problem at this stage. Okay? On the other hand, what I classify as modeling is that we look at the problem at the level that it is posed. We assemble all the physics that we know. Okay? And of course, it's a complex problem, so that physics might not exist. So we don't hesitate to use whatever mathematical methods are available, including empirical modeling. 
we make our predictions with uncertainties because the uncertainties themselves really give us a lot more work to do yeah? and, and a very systematic way of identifying where the work needs to be done and finally of course we validate the problem experimentally and by disseminating the algorithms because somebody else can use them in a different way and discover something else okay? so I'll finish off uh, here and thank you for your attention I think there is plenty of time for questions Well, that was a fabulous start to our event today. Um, Harry always gives you two things, in my view, enthusiasm and challenging new ideas, and we've certainly had that again today. Thank you, Harry. Um, I should add that uh, the plenary lectures are being videoed, so that these will be available as lectures on our website uh, in due course. Now, we have uh, 10 minutes for questions, so would anybody like to... Uh, Pose the first one or add a comment, please. And if you would like to do so, could you give us your name and affiliation? Please, Mike. Thank you, Mike Reddy, University of Birmingham. Can you tell us how that steel has got to the very fine microstructure deforms? Yes, uh, it's a very good question. So we, we have uniform ductility up to 30%. Uh, well, what happens is that during the later stages of deformation, the austenite actually trips into margin site and that helps us to get the work hardening which maintains the uniform ductility. So it's the fact that it's a composite because it's a, you know, a very fine composite. If you make just a one nanometer size grain, you actually get very little plasticity because the work hardening disappears. You, know, you don't have the dislocation generation which gives you work hardening. Okay. Another question or comment? Come on now, there must be something there. He stirred something in you. I have to say, I'm a bit nervous about welding a 0.9% carbon material, steel. Um, have you actually done that with some conventional arc process with a well, certain well, amount of hydrogen present? Excellent question. And <laughs> in June, I was in Arizona and I presented a similar lecture where I said, you know, the stuff can't be welded because it's one weight percent carbon. Of course, you know, you guys, you like a challenge, right? So, this guy stood up and he said, yes, I can weld it. All I have to do is preheat it to 200 degrees centigrade because there's no transformation. It's fully austenitic. Weld it and then you put it into the piece of oven and you've generated the right microstructure. <laughs> so, it has been done. Uh, of course, how practical that is for a large structure, I don't know. Mm. Yeah. I like the bolting idea, actually. I think that's yeah. <laughs> Any comments or further questions? No. Yes, please. George Thompson, University of Manchester. You saw the slide that's about the specimen that had corroded. Um, what is the corrosion resistance of the new alloys? It's nothing special. You know, uh, it, it doesn't contain anything which should give it enhanced corrosion resistance over normal, ordinary steel. <coughs> so you're quite right. It, it's not designed for that. Thank you, George. Okay, well, if there are no further questions, Thank you. Um, uh, this gives us an opportunity to make your way to your various symposia. Uh, can I, on your behalf, thank Harry again for a wonderful start to our event today. And uh, as always, let's give Harry the usual round of applause.